Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. If you're passionate about the tactical skirmish game that brings together strategy, lore, and creativity, you are in the right place. Don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, and stay updated with our latest episodes. If you want to support the show, check out our Patreon. Your support means a lot to us. Follow us by using the social media links in the podcast description for all the latest news, and be sure to leave a review to let us know what you think. Thanks for tuning in. Here's today's episode. Big Sounds vibes with Brandon Bean from the Pacific Northwest. Out here, a repeat blooded champion from year to year on at the World Championships of Warhammer. Trapped, as it seems, in a world of elites. How are we feeling? I'm feeling surrounded. Especially with Plague Marines added into the mix, I'm feeling surrounded. It's all right. I'm used to it. You've got the you've got enemies on all sides, exactly where you want them. Everywhere, and like I can't. Even, they're all chaos ones too. Like the 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 fiends of the meta are all the chaos marines too. So it's not like I could be like, oh, I'm the good guys, the emperor protect me. No, I'm playing blooded. I'm like on their side. They're just all around me. See, that's the best part about chaos. The only reason why chaos can't take over real space is because everybody is pushing at the same time to try to get out. So really, you're just one of the pawns of the great game. Which god you appeal to at any given moment, the world may never know, especially now that Nurgle, Zinch, and the mix of the gods are out there out about causing chaos in the Imperium Nihilus. And honestly, like the biggest lie about chaos is that they're undivided. That's not the case. They're all fighting each other all the time, and this is a perfect example. Have you guys ever seen The Simpsons, the, the part where the doctor tries to explain to Mr. Burns that he's just, like, about to die because he has so many diseases trying to attack his body at the same time that he's barely staying alive? That's what I feel like the meta is. Just all the Marines packing in at the same time. We can't quite figure out which one's going to pop out and, and be declared the winner. We say that, but me and Jason have been doing a week-to-week stat show on our four Patreon listeners. We know which god it's doing best. It's Warp Coven. <laughs> yeah, by far, too. <laughs> uh, secretly, Novitiates. Yikes. Y- big yikes town. I think they're worse than Warp Coven. It's just Warp Coven's more popular. Maybe I only say that because Shane is an incredibly good player, and he just so played them well. I... I have a good friend of mine, Zach DW. Who's, uh, oh yeah, he's on, a really, like, really good point. player too. He's one of my locals. He's one. Of, he's one of like the guys up, up in this area. Um, and I actually met him online, and we ended up, we've gone to multiple tournaments now together. Um, Zach is a, like a novitiate's fiend, and he was really dreading the edition when it first came out. And now that he's got a good twenty, thirty games under under his belt with the team, he's like, "Wow, these guys might just just be S tier." Um, they're super S tier. I think they're really good. I don't think Novitiates are S tier. I think they'd be at, at the top of the meta, at the top of the A tier for sure. Um, they're a lot easier to pilot than some of the teams, but overall, I don't think they just quite push into the S tier like, like the three do. I'm. I want to hear more about that. Um, what? So, why not? So the biggest thing with Warp Coven and Legionnaires, like. Between reducing AP and then when you don't need to reduce AP, you have minus one to hit across your team. is just really, really tough for so many teams to get around. And then the biggest thing about Novitiates is can you do seven wounds to a Novitiate uh, through its half damage? And the Legionnaires go, that's it. That's no problem. Um, they have four or five chain swords on even just normal warriors. So you can literally take a leader and five warriors have them switch marks at will and just cause chaos for all of the novitious players. Uh, I'm not saying there's not play, but I am saying it's limited. It's not quite nearly as linear as a lot of people think. I think that novi- it's on the novitious player to play that well, which is what puts them in the A tier, not the S tier, because the Legionnaires and Warp Coven are so forgiving with their gameplay that someone unskilled with the teams and unfamiliar with matchups can just sort of stat check and win games. I think that's a really good point. Yeah. Cause like the, the sisters like novitiates, I do think they have like the power to be horrendously more insane than legionary, 
but legionary just like do it on easy mode you just yeah like and like warriors honestly are like part of what make legionaries s tier because you're just like they're whatever you need them to be at all times it's like like the when intercessors were at their worst it's like now you you have that but they can just like flex their power when they activate to be just like intercessor plus like times five and you just like run around and go nuts oh i need to punch through half damage well cool i'm going to boost damage my warrior's gonna my chainsword warrior is gonna go plus one damage so now it's a five six chainsword good luck novitiate yeah yeah, I mean, when it comes to dealing with the massive number of elites and how strong they are, we had we're, we wanted to bring you on because Blooded are one of the teams that both me and Jason tagged as a team that seems reasonably good at not quite being an elite team as far as the meta goes. You've got access to Infiltration and Seek and Destroy, which is an interesting set of tack ops that lets you kind of approach the game at different speeds against different sizes of teams. And, you know, even against Novitiates, Blooded have some amount of play as long as you get your missiles in position to go send off and go slap people around. So how have you been kind of dealing with what currently seems like the, the meta? You know, Legionary, Warp Coven, they're almost 50% of the meta week to week. They are doing well. Warp Coven just crushing people. And um, obviously, Blooded, they've got some issues, but they've also got some tools. They've got the, the big ogre and the enforcer. They've got some new tricks that they didn't have before. So what have you been doing that you've found success with? Or has it all just come to ruin as uh, the great plan dictates? Uh, it's a mix of both, honestly. I have yet to face Legionnaires or play as Legionnaires yet, surprisingly. So all my talk about Legionnaires so far has just been Theory Hammer, which is just sort of shocking that I have not run into someone that's like, I want to try these out, and I just haven't run into that yet. I'm looking for it. Um, I have played Warp Coven, and I've played as Warp Coven a number of times. Um, so far, even when I just unga bunga, I am undefeated on Warp Coven, and I don't think that's really indicative of my skill with them because I'm just going like, okay, cool. My fly sword charges six because he has fly through all the terrain, kills and then shoots and kills. Cool. Next talk, and he just sits there forever, ignoring piercing one. Oh, I counter it. Cool. I heal myself for the damage you you might have been able to inflict through the three of armor save. Neat. You've been using a oh. flying Tempiric Sorcerer with the secondary melee weapon, so you could just yeah. blast them. So you charge someone through wall, bonk them on the head, and then flux blast someone. And then on counteract, you're just healing yourself. Yeah, so a big part of like my blooded gameplay has just been slowed down a lot. A lot of 2.0 blooded was like, okay, I'm going to set up four to five threats on turn two, and however many the play- my opponent wants to go, if they want to go for blood... Let's do this. And Blooded can match, could match almost every single team in the game with damage output just across the board, even on In the Dark, which poses some issues with like Geller Pox and things of that nature. But um, even when Felgor is a menace, it's doable with Blooded. We had ways to guarantee crits. We had ways to punch through 10 wounds. So it wasn't, wasn't the worst thing in the world. Blooded had tools. They're not easy to pilot and to be able to use those tools appropriately. And I think that is still true to an extent into 3.0. Um, I've had a couple games in the Warp Coven so far, and Warp Coven players get so far have just been baited into thinking they're Im- impervious to melee. The I think they haven't really realized, or at least locally, haven't really realized that they're a just shooting powerhouse more than with some melee support. Um, even their Zangors are just super resistant to shooting, so that's where like they really need to start flexing a bit more. Um, but even then, there's ways to get around it, and Blooded can do the damage to punch through. So, I was going to ask, what combos specifically have you found powerful on Blooded to manage your opponent's, you know, tanky threats? You know, 14 wounds is a lot to chew through, even if you've got power swords. You know, Blooded, most of the operatives hit with four attacks. So being able to get all the way up to that 14 wound mark, it's probably not going to happen in one activation unless you've done a little bit of work. So what layers of offense and staging have you used to be able to chip away at your opponents and then get the kills because before you could kind of probably manage 12 wounds against a legionary with a power sword and a little bit of gumption but nowadays you know you're waiting for turn three before you can really get all of your threats in range so how have you been approaching you mentioned that before on turn two you would go hard now it feels like you're doing a combination of between two and turn three for most aggressive starts so how have you interacted with that against the meta uh I've been caught out with it a couple times in my game. So, for example, against Night Lords specifically, they just go, hey, look, you're one guy that's in the key spot. 
he's not activating, and then we kill him, uh, and you're not really in position to, to do much else because blood don't quite dive as deep as they used to anymore. Um, so I've been setting up speed bumps, really. The sort of what, setting up speed bumps, setting up uh, the re, redirect a fight, um, and then going for chip damage on multiple operatives with my grenadier. So being able to reposition and then yell at the grenadier to move forward to give him three appeal and crack grenade for some early damage. Getting four damage through on an elite brings him down to that 10 wound breakpoint, which like I said, Blood have no problem punching through 10 wound breakpoints. Um, and then if I do get first activation with him again, it's really common for me to actually go after someone else. Um, bringing a Marine down to 10 wounds mean, means he's in that area that I can kill him. Once they're at that 14 wound breakpoint, it's a lot harder to really punch through. Yeah. Um, and the other speed bumps, that, speed bumps that I've been using are the Flinzer and the Thug. Um, the Thug is just tanky enough that he can get four to eight damage in, depending on if they don't roll crits or not. Um, even a chain sword becomes three, five in, into him. And if they don't roll a crit, he just randomly gets two hits in. Um, and then the Flinzer being able to strike on death, get six to seven damage in before he goes down, brings Marines down into a, a more favorable spot. Yeah, that's great. So you mentioned that you've played Warp Coven, you haven't played Legionary. That leaves Phobos, Angels of Death, and Nemesis Claw as the other elites roaming about the rest of the meta and the new Death Guard. How have you have you played against any of those? How have your games felt against them? Because I would expect that Death Guard would probably feel particularly rough because a lot of your damage hits at about three damage. So getting dropped down to two is going to make those 14 wounds just feel crazy, I assume. Honestly, I have yet to play against Death Guard. I've played one game as them, as you know, Death Guard are an extremely new team. Um, and I only needed one model to complete them because I had the heroes set from before. Uh, so I will, uh, I painted them up. Um, Angels of Death, I've played against multiple times. I have walked through Angels of Death every single time so far. They are not tough enough. They're not tanky enough. Even with the dueler ability that throws off my melee real bad. They're just not tanky enough to live. Um, Meltal still crushes. Plasma still does enough plink damage to make them scared. Um, and as weak as the crack grenade is, once you get any amount of damage through, now they're just back to 12 wound marines. So we had no problems dealing with intercession before. We had no problems dealing with Justine before. So Blooded have no problems really with the new Angels of Death, in my opinion. Yeah, that makes a lot Death of sense. Guard, Death Guard will be a bit trickier because the because there are 14 wounds and the damage reduction is going to be a thing. The biggest part about that is actually going to be the minus one to hit uh, the, from Contagion that is going to be massed across my um, field. That is a little bit mitigated by some of the tools that Blooded have gotten since the 3.0. Uh, so I'm not terribly worried about the matchup. Um, Tearing through Geller Pox Infected were, was a thing that Blooded had to try to do and could do on some matchups, and I think that the same problem persists. It's a DPS test, and Blooded typically pass the DPS tests. Yeah, I think, so, like, against uh, Death Guard, the Contagion Aura is free with the banner, but, like, the banner also needs to, to be the centerpiece of, like, the Miasma for it to work well, because if Death Guard Castle up, you can just walk all over them because you have a bigger threat range, so they really need to, like, push at you and then, like, the centerpiece of the push to make it effective pretty much has to be the banner. So then if you just missile your speed bumps into the banner, because you come from outside of their threat range, and you just, like, run up with the flenzer, you run up with a thug, and you just, like, missile into the banner and then cook him. And, like, Death Guard is so CP hungry after that, they can't just, like, use all the stuff that they need. Because you need, like, Miasma of Pestilence or whatever the Cloud of Flies. Um, you need, like, Lumbering Death so that you can actually have rerolls so you can do stuff. And then you also need... Like, they have so many cool poise. If you just, like, uh, Contagion, if that's not free, you just, like, missile your speed bumps into the banner and then just starve them out of CP and then just, like, go nuts on them in turns three and four. And I think Blooded just eat Death Guard alive. Yeah, I think that as long as the Blooded player is aware of the timing of that, because if you do it too early, you're going to give them two heals. And uh, speaking of someone that has played the team, that Death Guard heal proc seven... I think it's like 20% of the time because of the way the dice roll. So you're healing like four to seven every time you cast that spell. 
And if you give them two heals, you're not killing anything on Death Garden. You literally sort of need to wait it out. And again, this plays back into what I was talking about, my game plan being slowed down, is that normally turn two, first activation, I'm going. I'm going to go in. I'm going in with a plasma pistol. I'm going with a melting gun. I'm going in with my diabolic bomb of death. And I'm killing a room. I'm, that's the goal. Is I'm going in. I'm killing whatever that guy is. Even if I'm only sending one guy this turn for a route or whatever the case was, that's what I used to do. And it's not quite the same anymore. And so slowing down, forcing the play guard player to come into the midboard, come and contest me on those objectives. And as much as the contagion is scary, blooded have relentless abound for their melee operatives. So it's not nearly as effective against me anymore. Um, being able to, for the enforcer uh, to be able to yell at the doctor for more relentless drugs has changed the how powerful the doctor is by a lot. It's amazing. Yeah, you want to talk about the differences that make the doctor that much more important in this edition? Yeah, so the biggest difference, uh, he used to give out a 6-up fill in the pain. He still gives out relentless or a 2d3 heal. Um, the biggest, there's multiple changes that bring the doctor's uh, stonks uh, up in this edition. One is that relentless and rerolls is very, very few and far between. So there's not a lot of people shutting down as many full board rerolls as there are, uh, which means that we can give out relentless at the start of the game, like we did all always. But now the enforcer can force a one AP action. Well, giving out drugs is a one AP action. So instead of starting the game commonly with only two drugs running out there, now I very commonly have the ogren with relentless. The leader with power sword gets relentless. Then the enforcer with power fist gets relentless. The uh, butcher normally doesn't get any buffs because from the new edition, he got ceaseless. So he doesn't need relentless on top of ceaseless. He already hits on threes with ceaseless is a very good profile, especially for a power weapon. Um, the flenzer has always had ceaseless. And now that ceaseless is actually better than when it was on him, he's still hitting on threes, ceaseless lethal five when he's within one of train, which is everywhere. Um, and so the only person that doesn't really have mainly rerolls is the thug or my guns. And the thug, like I said, is more of a speed bump. He's more of a defensive piece. And he's brutal and hits on threes. Like, he's got a solid profile. Not Nothing that I need to, like, really focus in on boosting. So it's all, it's all gravy on that side. Yeah. Um, one thing that I wanted to point out that we, we've kind of, like, sort of, like, T tapped on a little bit um in the previous edition it, the meta thing used to be out activating people for that last activation advantage that is actually still really good as long as you don't like give your opponent a bunch of counteractions so like everyone's just like so hyped on elites that they totally forgot that lacked at last activation is actually still really good and and you kind of like tapped on that a little bit and i just wanted to like highlight that as anyone that is playing not elites trying to defeat elites that's still a great tool and like don't sleep on that at all yeah you really learning how to play against counteract is going to be really what defines if you're able to play a horde team right now um there was in my war coven game uh, I had to prioritize charging and killing his Temperic Sorcerer. And even though it wasn't the sequence I wanted it to be in, and it gave up um, an extra operative to a shooting attack who just barely lived, I, even though I didn't like that, I had to do it. Because if I had waited, he would have gotten one of the shots off and killed the one operative that was still exposed, and then counteracted when I don't have any more threat to reach him. And healed himself for 2d3 on the counteract, which after I've already put in three operatives of damage trying to kill that sorcerer, I cannot let that happen. If that sorcerer lives through that turn, I think I lose that game at, on the backswing of that. Yeah, you do way more play on like a razor's edge trying to play against like play against elites with the horde team. Um there's a couple other points that I kind of like sketched out of questions for you. Um one of them that I would like to get in, and I'm gonna I'm gonna like come out swinging with my opinion and then ask for yours uh there is the plasma gun versus the plasma pistol and it seems like the popular opinion was the plasma gun is better but i like the plasma pistol more because you hit on threes and that's way more valuable to me than the extra damage that hits on fours what what do you think i think that if i didn't have a relentless power sword instead of it it would be a consideration there's a lot of teams where i'm considering the plasma pistol 
uh, specifically because the trick, if you will, is that the chieftain now always counts as gaze of the gods when he's in your opponent's territory as long as he has a blooded token. So on turn two, he's one of the few people that can reliably get gaze of the gods and get three APL. So you can move dash and shoot with the plasma pistol or charge fight and shoot with three APL with a uh, moment of repute to give him three APL once he gets gaze of the gods, once he enters the opponent's half of the territory. That combined with the new Wicked Blades, which makes his knife 4-3, or I'm sorry, 3-4 instead of 3-3 three, three like it was before. So you can charge a 7 of models, assuming it's like Wormblade or the Mirror or maybe Sisters. I wouldn't do this into Sisters specifically because I don't take the Plasma Pistol loadout into Sisters, but into other 7 win teams, Wormblade and Inquisition even, um, you can charge, guarantee the crit for 4 damage. You just need one hit on your other 3 dice, and even if you don't, um, very commonly you, you couple this with Reckless Aspirants, which has got a big glow up. All our strategic and tactical plays got a nice little glow up. Um, it is Reckless Aspirants is gives punishing when you have a blooded token in and you're in your opponent's territory. So you charge, guarantee a crit, which guarantees one hit out of the, your three dice. So you roll the hit on threes with one crit, punishing means it, probably two hits and a crit. You kill a 7 room model, then you 3 APL and shoot another 7 room model and get double kills. Being able to source double kills on this team is amazing. And with the addition of crack grenades, I that's part of why, also why I don't rate the plasma pistol as well. Because very commonly, who's throwing my crack grenades? If it's not my grenadier, it is someone with Gaze of the Gods in combination with Reckless Aspirate. So I'm guaranteeing a crit and a hit. So of those four dice, if only one of them hits, it's a crit and two hits. So it's it's really reliable pushing through damage that way. Yeah, that is pretty good, especially because like what you were saying immediately about like the chip damage is really what matters. Like you don't set your expectations that high on things like the crack grenade. You kind of just like do the chip damage, you whittle them down and then you punch through with 10 damage. Um, so f- segueing off of that, what are your number one pieces that push through 10 damage the most reliably? Uh, everyone. <laughs> So the only ones that don't really do it reliably are the Flenser and the Thug. Um, The Butcher is a power weapon, like I said, so 4-6, lethal 5. He consistently does it. The the leader does it almost a thousand percent of the time. Uh, With auto crit with a power weapon, with punishing, makes it 10 damage very, very consistently. The Enforcer of the Power Fist, Ogren with a punch. Um, Melta and Plasma can even do 10 damage. Even though Plasma is not what it once was, Lethal 5 with a possible source of rerolls uh, with a glory kill, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, gives it, lets it punch through 10 damage pretty reliably. Uh, so it's, doing 10 damage is not usually the question. The question is, does the 10 damage do a thing? And uh, into elites, the answer is not always yes. So that's where the problem lies. Yeah, man, I, I I do really like your concept about speed bumps because I was noodling around with blooded for a while when when like the meta was flooding with elites. I was like, oh, how do I flee? Where do I go? Um, and I did a bunch of games with blooded and I it 100 percent did not work for me at all. Um, but I'm just like very interested and in, like, you know, seeing hearing about success with blooded and 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 just like. That's fun. That's inspiring. I think it's really cool. Um, I mean, the way I was playing was like I was trying to I I took four warriors in most of the games and I was just like run out there and do chip damage because if I hit you and then you hit me and then I hit you again and then you kill me and then I explode on you, I've done like a fair bit of damage and then like group activating warriors doing that. And I was like, I can get away with killing a lot of stuff. But then if I stage too aggressively, I do some chip damage. You get double kills anyway. And then all of a sudden I'm cooked. Yeah, being able to stage out uh, and slow down my own gameplay has been something that I've been really struggling to do. Uh, I got baited into a number of games. Where I'm like, okay, no aggression, no aggression, no CP rerolls, no CP rerolls. Don't do it. Don't do it. Just just accept that you only rolled one hit on the grenade. Grenade. Just accept it. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. And then I'm like, all right, cool. So two CP. Oh, fuck. I just, I just told myself, just did the thing. And so it's been a, it's been a rough adjustment. Um, but it's been well worth it being able to see some of the plans come into fruition. And is there like an example plan that you've 
basically decided like this is how i'm going to approach the game against the elites that you're gonna you're definitely gonna run into at the world championships because both you and jason are going to the world championships you're pl- probably playing blooded i assume because that's the team that you're the best known for it's the team that you love and jason I don't know he's playing but i would expect some version of marines i've definitely been playing phobos and i'm telling everyone and i'm not scared to tell everyone i think they're really really good and i'm like yeah i'll tell you all my secrets because i think you can't even like you, you either can't avoid it or i just lose and that's fine because i'm just like here to make friends it's all so, good. Yeah, I, what, what do you, what has worked for you and how are you expecting to manage the cavalcade of ceramite that you're gonna deal with in a, in a, in a bit really so far i only have the one win into elites out of my four games uh, out of my three games into chaos elites uh angels of death i am 4 now. So I don't really have any problems with Angels of Death. I don't really expect to see many Angels of Death at Worlds either. I think that we're going to see a lot of Legion. I think we're going to see a lot of Orc Coven. I think we're going to see a smattering of Nemesis Claw. Um, and I think we're going to see a smattering of Inquisition as well. So sort of the top of the meta is what we're expecting, right? Um, I think that Novitiates are going to make a surprise appearance for two to three players. Uh, although with the number of players going to Worlds this year, that might double. Because last year we only had, what do we have, 30? eight players 38 last year yeah and so we're at more than double that this year uh, i don't know what information i'm allowed to disclose on that but um we have more players this year than last year yeah. we'll see what it actually ends up being but that's in the future really yeah but so like last year uh last year was the year of commandos right we had seven commando players at worlds the year before that was hunter clade we had like six hunter clade players out of four or hunter four. clade Four of them out of the what, ten players that went, you know, it was, eight. <laughs> yeah, it was half the. Field. I chose not to play Hunter Clay because I decided it would be boring to play a mirror match. Yeah, yeah, because Travis was there. Been there for all the years. Like, yeah. Um. So, like, I expect to see the the top third of the meta be Warp Coven and Legionnaires mix with Inquisition pulling up the rear. Um. And I think Blooded have tools. I think they struggle into some of it, but I think Blooded have tools. Uh, I think that the biggest hurdle for Blooded is actually going to be Higher Tech Circle. Ooh, it's yep. one of the pseudo-elite teams out there that has the tools to deal with Legionnaires. Uh, I know that Kellen Foster pretty much went into nothing but Legionnaires at SoCal Open in 3.0, uh, and he's going to Worlds. I know he's been on the high C bandwagon, and I know he's been sort of driving that wagon himself. So I expect him to see to see him and similar caliber players on heretic circle. And that is a matchup I really have not figured out. Um, and I might just balls the wall, unga bunga and see where the, where the dice fall after that. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. I was like, heretic circle, I think is like, is the upset. I think heretic circle is going to like, everyone's going to be like, Oh man, warp cover and all this stuff. And then heretic circle is going to be like, bro, I've got, I've been like, I have a solution. I'm, I'm ready. I'm here. They're just going to come in and just like cook some people. It's people are going to be caught off guard. Someone's going to come flying with heretic circle and just like cause a ruckus. And I'm here for it. Written yeah. On. I think that, I think the biggest problem that legionnaires and warp coven players are going to have is sort of the intercession intercession problem back when intercession first got released is that everyone was playing them. And so that if if you're going to have a game plan, you had to have a game plan into Legion into intercession because you knew you were going to face them. It was going to be a third of the tournament, every single tournament. So if you didn't have a plan into intercession, you didn't have a plan to win the tournament at all. And so everyone's going to have a plan into Legionnaires. Everyone's going to have a plan into Warp Coven. I don't think many people are going to have nearly the strong plans into Higher Tech Circle. And I think that people are going to look at the Novitiates and you're going to have two classes of player that understand really what that team can do. And then the team that, and then players that don't really understand it until they're witnessing it as it punches them in the face. Yep. Yeah, that's always the problem at being the top of the meta. You've got to ha- deal with everyone knowing your rules just as well as you know yours, which is not something that everyone is good at. Because obviously, when it comes to playing at a very competitive level, a lot of players are really good at knowing what they have and what their opponents have. But a lot of players haven't seen all the teams. So getting faced with other players who are just as good as you, who know all of your tricks, means that if you're a good player, you should be playing around what those tricks entail. And sure, your opponent knows that Legionnaire are going to be able to turn off piercing. So can you just set up a list that's just not going to shoot and is just going to go melee? Maybe you can do that. 
when it comes to Warp Coven being able to have those Zangors, that's really why Warp Coven have all the flexibility. It's not because they're a strong elite team that can just play six models, play elites, have three APL, 14 wounds, tank stuff on two up saves and shoot people. It's because they can also take Zangors and go all the way out to like a three, three, six split, have nine activations that are all relevant. And that's really where the scary thing is for Legionary, because you never know where on the dartboard they're going to be as far as activation gaming and what they're going to focus on. The flex of both of those teams is something that is really impressive that we just didn't see in 2.0. The roster situation is definitely a big part of why a lot of the teams had restrictions in the past. Inquisition agents obviously made it into this edition smelling like a whole bouquet of roses, you know, being able to take a full, basically Warhammer 40k army into a tournament definitely has its perks, you know, being able to say, I don't like... I don't like psychers. I'm going to take a bunch of four, six power swords that ignore psychic abilities. Those same four, six power swords great against novitiates. Cause you just launch them into novitiate lines and the novitiates cannot interact with them fast enough. And you just die to them. Meanwhile, if you try to do anything, they stun your chain sword from the novitiates and then she gets chopped into little bits. Definitely a disaster. And you know, that's just one bad skew that everyone thinks is a joke. Like, Oh, why would we ever take the sisters? Well, there's a couple matchups where they're good. And then, you know, you look over at the caster kit and now the elite matchups, those look way easier. And the fact that one team can have all of those choices, as long as you've got the the moolah to <laughs> splash some cash at the problem, is really powerful. And that's why Warp Coven, Inquisition Agents, and Legionary feel so much more above everyone else, I think. Yeah. Along with the elites that can actually ignore piercing. That's obviously a big part of the raw power. Yeah, it's like literally like you show up to Worlds with your Inquisition army. You've got your whole roller tray. You've got like 10 million models on it. You're checking in. They're like, are you here for Warhammer 40k or kill team? You're just like, why not both? I'm bringing my Warhammer 40k to kill team. Yeah, but obviously, the, the, you know, Blooded got some other toys. So you've got a little bit of flex. How have you been using the flex that your roster selection has allowed you? Or is it that kill team three is now basically taking you to just take the Enforcer and the Ogre and all the time? Yeah, I have been taking the Enforcer and the Ogren so often. Um, it's been a whole new world. And part of that is because the flexibility of the Ogren has gone up. He's no longer trapped behind doors. Being able to open a door is amazing. And even though you cannot comms buff him, he can still get plus one APL from Gaze of the Gods because it's not the, com- the restriction is on the comms ability, not on giving him plus bonus APL. So... If you give him gaze, he has a rending, stunning weapon. And I'm using 2.0 terms because they make more sense to my brain. For those of you that, that is shock and... Uh, still rending. Rend, still rending. Thank you. Um, so you can give him gaze. He can go three APL, open door, charge, do damage, heal for one, fight, do damage, heal for another. Um, I've had him go as low as four hit points and then end the game at 10. Just because he does damage and with the blooded equipment to heal after you do a thing means that he charges, does D3 damage, gains a health back. Fights, does damage, gains a health back. And it's been amazing. Whoa. Um, that Those coupled stack. With being, yeah. So not only does that stack, but also he can still throw crack grenades. And if he's got Gaze of the Gods and Reckless Aspirants, now you're talking about a 5-6 melee wet monster who can charge, fight, and kill practically everything in the game except a full health Nurgle Legionnaire, probably, and a full health Death Guard Legionnaire. But everything else probably dies between the D3 charge and 5 6 damage. Um, and who can I then. Relentless after, Rending Shock and. Yeah, Relentless Rending Shock, right? On top of that, oh, and Shock can now block crits. So if your opponent's like, oh, I rolled nothing but crits, and you're like, cool, get rid of all none of them. Good talk. Uh, Got and him. then after he kills. Yeah, after he kills something, he can throw a crack grenade. And you're like, oh, now he's throwing it on fives because he's injured. He already retains one. Out of the other three dice, maybe get one hit, turn another one into a hit from, with punishing because of reckless aspirants, and suddenly you have a two hit, one crit crack grenade out of a two health ogren. Like, it is damage that punch pushes out. It's very common for me to take crack grenades as an equipment choice if it has not been clear i love that um so what what equipment do you drop to clear for crack for crack grenades or like what do you take three blooded and crack grenades or do you what blooded equipment is trash so if any the blooded equipment isn't quite all trash um i'm gonna remember i'm gonna mess up the names of them so pretty much we have wicked blades for 
to make all of our blades 3-4, which is pretty common, but it also applies to the trench sweeper and the prison shank from the leader, which is four attacks, notably. Um, and uh, that's a really solid one that people are shocked that I drop all the time. Uh, the other equipment is Sinister Trophies, which prevents rerolls of one when you're within two of a blooded token. And that is really situational, but there's so much ceaseless in the game. There's a lot of ceaseless, not nearly as much relentless. And being able to restrict those ones has been a... It doesn't matter until it really matters, and it, it pulls through. Um, the Symbols of Bloody Worship is what heals you after you do a thing with, with damage. That I have not dropped at all. Um, and the only one that I have not taken is the i don't remember the one what it's called. Or yep. the extra blood yeah the problem with it is that you already need a blood or token in order to gain it so i don't i don't want to missile someone out that has the blood or token early on in turn two only to just regen the one i don't need to regen the one by that point i need to earn it earlier um and with the comms just generating one he just gets my first blood token and generates it. So I have Gaze of the Gods guaranteed turn three, and I go into turn two with two blood tokens to give out for the reaching that I need to do. Um, so that's just been pretty much how I handle that. Um, and blood tokens, again, become the defensive resource for Dark Favor, which has gotten buffed as well. Yeah, because Dark Favor can now also be used in the fight, which it was not that was not part of the combo back in the day, right? Correct. So it used to be one, it was only in shooting. Two, the opponent had to be able to see both of the targets, which was really how you played around it. Um, and so a lot of my locals knew that, and none of the no one when I went and traveled knew that. Um, now it's been changed twofold. One, it's uh, threefold actually. Uh, one, it is visible to the one you're redirecting from. So I, I don't care if my opponent can see them or not, I can pull someone that he cannot see to redirect the attack. Uh, two, it is three inches, not two inches. I, it still does not work against blast torrent, blast or torrent weapons, which is carried over from second edition. But now that you can sit outside of three inches, there's not that many blast three in the game. And when there is, you just plan on not giving them that attack. And most of them are extremely weak anyway. So I don't mind sitting outside of three because it denies a lot of the blast two, which is where a lot of the scary stuff is. Um, and thirdly, the change is that it can redirect fights, which means you're like, cool, I'm going to charge. A lot of people are like, cool, I'm going to charge your grenadier. Like, that's nice. You're going to fight the Ogren. Have fun. And they're like, yeah, oh, that's, that's not very good at all. Yes, that is not what I wanted. I wanted to fight a guardsman. I'm like, yep, I know. And now you're dead. Good talk. So the team's obviously done a lot of things that are really nice, and one of the few Horde-style teams that feels like it actually has some game plans against the 14 Wound Menace that currently exists. Yeah, Is Blade I, the only team that you've really played? Have you felt like there were other Horde teams that you've looked at that you felt like might have a good option into dealing with some of the elites? I think Wormblade have some play. I think Wormblade have more play than Brood Brothers, surprisingly. Um, and that is just a personal feel. It's not anything to really back it up. I was playing Wormblade near the end of second edition as part of my game series that I do. I play 10 games with a team and then do uh, written bat reps for them. And then at the end of those 10 games, I do a synopsis of the teams. And playing Wormblade felt pretty good into that and makes me feel like they have some options. Unfortunately, ignoring AP1 means that a lot of their shooting power is just the teeth are taken out of it. Um, even the, the Keller Morph with his amazing shooting profile still just doesn't quite punch like he used to uh, into AP nothing, two up armor saves that are floating around. Um, so I want to say Wormblade. The other option would be Brew Brothers right behind them. Uh, besides the obvious Inquisition, Inquisition is sort of a menace, you know, regardless. Um, I don't think Brew Brothers are nearly as easy to pilot as Wormblade are, because their tools are so much more finicky now. They're not quite as straightforward as they were. Um, they still have some options, but it requires a lot of investment into playing that play style in the new edition that I just didn't have time to invest in before Worlds coming up after, you know, 
a month and a half and suddenly we're, we're at worlds with the new edition. So I did, just didn't have the time to transition. Yeah. So kind of a commonality that you've noticed is take a bunch of dorks, like those 10 guys that do mission actions, got some guns and then a couple big power pieces that let you basically play like a mini Marine that can go against the other Marine. Yeah. Being able to get that chip damage in and make that chip damage stick is one of the hardest aspects about it. Uh, which is part of why I believe Warp Coven is the strongest team in the meta right now, because they're out of their counteraction to heal for 2d3 nine inches away from that guy is so powerful. Um, and especially if he activates later on in the turn when you're already trying to push through damage, him being able to do that twice, 4d3 of heals is a lot of healing. There's a reason why those spells were restricted in 2.0 um to once per turn uh there's a reason why all of the healing aspects take a action to do from any other medic and equivalent type thing so being able to do that on counteract is extremely powerful and part of why warp coven are so forgiving to play yeah um one kind of trend that i've been seeing across a bunch of things is embracing the flexibility is the key and like you kind of touched on that with like you know, sometimes maybe the plasma pistol is good sometimes, but like the power sword is really good sometimes. And like, you just have to be like open minded and flexible to take the different options. Um, and then like the flexibility is what makes legionary so amazing. They have so many options so you can see what you're up against and you can adapt to it. You can be there. So it's like, you can't really like gone are the days. I mean, they weren't ever super there, but gone are the days that you can just like take one single skew and hammer through anything. Um, even though it's my favorite thing, uh, it's the high level play is really just like flexibility and, and leaning into it. And like Warp Coven, you can take rubrics, you can take goats, you can take gunners, you can take whatever. Um, there's a lot of flexibility there. And then like the key with Blooded is also that flexibility. It's like understanding your threats, being flexible to to meet and adapt them. Um, I just think that's that's interesting. It's kind of been like a trend I've been seeing, kind of just wanted to shout it out a little bit. No, definitely. The the flexibility in the teams is nothing to be scoffed at. Warp Coven before we're not near the end of second edition. I will say hot take and say Warp Coven were not a bad team. They were a bad team at the start of the edition for sure. But after m- multiple buffs, they were not a bad team. The problem with the team is they were extremely difficult to pilot and not nearly as forgiving as they are now. Um, be, having a five up invul was nice, but even then Melta and Plasma were still prevalent. Uh, they sort of they were still just the go tos for that, and so when you made a mistake with Warp Coven, you're like, oh dang, I really got punished because I didn't do this exactly perfectly, and that's part of what is making Legionnaires and Warp Coven so forgiving uh, is the healing and the durability combined. It's multiple layers. It's uh, I've listened to um, George. No, I was listening to Squad Games podcast today, and they talked about how. Uh, the flexibility between the teams is like what really sets them apart, how they don't have a roster restriction anymore, uh, sort of like Angels of Death do. Um, and something like that getting implemented would go a long way to sort of mitigating some of the power all three of those top meta teams have, Inquisition included. If we were limited Inquisition to, say, two or three of their auxiliary supports, that would change the dynamic of the team by quite a bit, even if you changed nothing else rules fundamentally which I still think all three of those teams need some tweaking. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they get a little bit of a tweak after, especially after the results for Worlds, because I assume that's going to be where GW is taking some amount of its balancing keys from, because they're going to be able to watch high-level games of the new edition. I assume there's going to be a billion elites, but time will tell. Once those rosters go public, I'm sure it'll be very interesting for everyone who's going and for anyone who's curious about what high-level kill team looks like. Like, what do people really think is strong? You know, the meta, as far as win rates go week to week, it's like 70% win rates for Warp Coven. Kind of crazy, but... There's also Void Dancer Troop, a team that nobody is talking about, but they've also had 60, 70 percent win rate for the last couple of weeks. Very curious to see how if anyone actually takes a, an elf team to Worlds and if they'll do well. And plus, like, I'm... yeah, and like Higher Tech Circle, I don't think has have been like super spectacular in their stats, but I think they're just like insanely good at the hands of someone that really knows what they're doing. And like Higher I think people are going to be just like creeping out of the bushes and just like smoking people with some crazy stuff that no one sees coming. 
Pyrotech Circle are one of those teams that you could explain what you can do on paper, sort of like how Corsairs were before in, in second edition with the teleport shenanigans. But really, you don't fully understand it until you see the impl- implications on the board. Um, and with some of these into the dark boards being so open and Necrons being such a shooting focused team, they can cause some issues depending on the map. Um, and the trade off is that there's such a there's a decent skill selling that's involved with that, right? Um, unfortunately, in my opinion, right now, the top teams between Legionnaires, Warp Coven, and Inquisition, they're they're not complicated enough to warrant how strong they are. In my opinion, they are ex- extremely forgiving to play and can just stat check and win games. Um, and I don't think that's really a healthy spot for the meta to be at. Yeah, that's probably that's probably true. That's yeah. kind of what I worry about. So, if they were to make some big changes and they hit, you know, the top three, do you think the meta would be in a good spot, or do you think they'd have to do some more proactive changes and give you know, a couple teams a little moose bush of touches to bring things down? You know, no issues. Yeah, I, I think like the, after they knock down the top three, there will be like a whole event or horizon we can't see past. And then like it's going to un- unveil like a whole wave of crazy stuff that's been waiting to creep out and just like be a menace. I think that if you limited, if, I think that hitting the top three, which is obviously needed by, you know, the mass consensus, right, brings Heritage Circle novitiates possibly Void Dancers and Felgor? even Blooded into the... Felgor, I... Felgor are practically unchanged from 2.0. If you couldn't ch- fight them then, you can't fight them now. That's that's still a thing. And teams that... You're not learning anything new in 3.0 to fight Felgor now. Because all their tricks are the exact same. There's nothing... The game plan hasn't changed from 2.0 to 3.0. Like, the game plan into Warp Coven now is drastically different for literally every single team in the game than it was in 2.0. Um, so as long as you have the same solid game plan into Felgor before, you can still deal with most Felgor players, in my opinion. Um, I forgot what I was talking about. Talking about changes to the rest of the meta. And, oh. you know, we were talking about how, you know, after the top three get nerfed, we'll still have Novitiates, we'll still have Higher Tech, we'll still probably have Felgor, because Felgor were good at the end of last edition, and they got nerfed a bunch, and they actually got all those nerfs unwound. So they're back to, you know, three models with 11 wounds, they've got uh, extra power on their deadly ambush, which they didn't have before. So there's a couple teams that I feel like if they were going to take a a more broad spectrum change to kind of irradiate the meta and get us a new crop of new teams, like, curious to see what they do. Or maybe we'll just take a light tap and then we'll see what grows underneath. Yeah, I'm not. A, it's super early on in the edition, so I wouldn't even be mad at a light tap. I think that it's going to be really interesting to see what the player base is for Worlds because even with the increase in players, I can almost guarantee you a, a third of the meta that's just not going to be represented, or there's going to be one person taking it just to get best in faction on Hearthkin Salvagers. Uh, someone. Hearthkin um, Sal- Salvagers are actually like kind of decent. Yeah, they are. And I'm not saying they're not. I'm just saying that, like, that's what uh, But yeah, last yeah, I get it. You know, John, the Reese took, you know, Hearthkin Salvages to Worlds to, almost to, like, play homage, but, like, got best in faction. But he wasn't, I mean, like, he trying was to win. homage, but it's it was funny because he got a payoff for doing the homage in yeah, he was like, best faction. But I don't think he cared about, I don't think any of us really. Yeah, he wasn't trying to win the tournament, right? It. Yeah, yeah, he wasn't trying to win with Hearthkin Salvages. He went there for for the fun of it, and that's totally okay. He he did well with them too. So like, he had to be he had to be respectful of his his gameplay on them either way. Um, but I don't think that like if if they touch the top three, I think you have some adjustments that need to be made into the next three or four. And the big question is how far into the A tier do you go with that? And I'm only asking because. Once the S tier gets agreed upon, which is pretty much Legionnaires, Warp Coven, and Inquisition, where does the top of the A tier stand? Where does it end? And who gets touched? Because right now, in my opinion, Plague Marines aren't quite S tier, but holy crap, are they near the top of A tier. And so are Novitiates. Angels of Death are solidly in the middle of A tier. Do they need a touch? I don't think so. Um... And that's just the question of like how far do you go down into that A tier before 
you just start letting teams be okay, you know, as they are. Or how far on the bottom teams do you push up? Because like crew feel like they need a lot. Exaction feel like they need something. Um, Blades of Lame get hounded on by everyone in Southern California. <laughs> um, There's something to be said for Blades of Cain on Volcus, but I think on In the Dark they have a uh, some more struggles. Yeah, on Into the Dark they're just like out of the game, but on Volcus it's like they're back in business. Yeah, my my two games in the Blades of Cain uh, beg to differ. <laughs> um, Man, I've been from... mulching people with Banshees, but only on Volcus. Yep, both games on Volcus, and I've lost multiple models to double kills. I'm like, cool. Oh, because you're That's playing with, yeah, with Blooded. I can see Blooded slapping around some Blades of Cain. Yeah, you get a double Our kill against Blades of Death. Yeah, Strike on Death. Oh my god. <laughs> Bitter Demise is so good. But all it takes is one power sword wielding chief with a crack grenade to take out two elves and that just disheartens your opponent so quickly. Um, and it with it, the combo together, it is actually really reliable to kill two elves like that. Um, the only one I've been taking champion very consistently, uh, in part because the elite meta, in part because Blooded can do double kills. Uh, and the only teams that I don't rate champion are into pyrotech circle and void dancers just because of the invul saves cause issues that was actually uh one of my big questions uh what are your favorite tech ops it sounds like champion is your favorite is there any other that make the radar so champion is definitely my favorite it plays into like what i like to do before where i launch a guy kill a guy i'm like okay cool those are my points um the other ones that i've i've tried out most I do not like gather surveillance. I understand it's been toted about because you can like get to a get to a side, have a decent shot, be in their turf, and because you have so many bodies, you can score with it. Typically, I still don't like it. Uh, it just doesn't quite fit into my play style. Uh, implant feels counterintuitive to all get out. I can't bring myself to play it. Um, I can't even name the other infiltrator. One, it's like wiretap. Uh, wiretap. I've seen it used. I struggle to understand even how to score it. So I've been skipping that one really commonly. Champion's been usually my go-to. Um, Storm Hostile Objective is also one uh, because the home objectives are typically not so deep that I can't at least go touch them. And if I'm going to go touch it, I'm going to go kill something that's on it. And it is one that I can at least score one on, if not two on, uh, even if they don't touch the middle objective, because I could just start aiming for the home objective and own that every time. Um, it's been hit or miss with that one. Uh, and then the last one, search, uh, over, Overrun, I think is the name of it. Yep. I is damn near impossible for Blooded. It is extremely difficult. And not because Blooded can't go in and kill stuff. It's that Blooded can't go in and kill stuff and then live. Plus you, is the hard part. plus you need three APLs worth of dudes that are like when they are alive at the end are three APL and that's just like well, not you, in the cards no, you or need at three least APL worth of operatives on your opponent's side that have done yeah. the thing so that's, you need two guys to do it that's pretty rough and it's, survive yeah, yeah. <laughs> the surviving do, is the hard part doing it fine surviving uh, <laughs> It, uh, yeah, it uh, really should blood. like man. That one needs that one needs a little bump. It, it could be like if you get a kill fully in their territory, and then you get another kill fully in their territory, that can get you two points. And or the second point can be from surviving. But like, I, I would love another tack op that lets you play aggressively and rewards you for it because we need a little like everyone's all trying to like tiptoe around and like, bro, we need a high tempo yeah. team in this mix. Nothing, give me, give me like a turbo those... speed violence overrun team. Yeah, nothing about the tech ops at all says go commit violence on them. Like almost none of them. Champion is one of them, but even then, cha like champion is kill a marine typically. You know, like okay, which guy do I think can kill a marine without getting eviscerated first? This guy, cool, because he's my melting. He's going to move, dash, and shoot from wherever away. And if I lose initiative, I'm going to protect him with the ogre that's going to take the punch. Fine, Ooh, and that's, that's like good. the combo you got to do. Um, yeah, that's something else about champion is that learning how to protect your champion is something you need to you really need to finagle and blooded have the tools to do that. That's amazing. Um, 
Yeah. I love Being that. able to redirect. Uh, position yourself. So typically I'll have my champion where someone can move dash and shoot them, but they have to move dash to shoot them. That's not a, a charge. It's a move dash. Uh, if I give them a charge target like that, I very typically will try to keep in mind uh, if they are able to double fight. Because if they're able to double fight, it makes redirecting a fight almost useless. Um, but if they can't double fight, then I can redirect the fight. Then they're stuck in melee with my Grenadier or whatever the case is. And I can fall back and shoot them or I can charge them with someone else and I can make magic happen. Um, but there's there's workarounds of like set up with that. And where before in 2.0, I would say Blooded are not a complicated team. They're straightforward. Set up your threats. Go do murder. Commit crimes. Do the thing. Now in 3.0, they're much... It's much. It's not that they're slower. It's that they take a little bit more patience to be able to do the things they really want to do and do it efficiently. Yeah, I think that's that's very good insight. Um, there's a couple things that I wanted to shout out that I think are uh, kind of silly, kind of cute, and maybe it's cool tech for the the blooded players. Um, but in my little journey into trying to figure out how to play blooded, uh, one of my favorite combos was because i took the plasma pistol on the leader because i was like i need the, to hit on threes and then i replaced my plasma gunner with a flamer and then it just turns out to be a hilarious thing that callous disregard plus a flamer is the silliest thing that's happened to kill team because it's like uh you run up and try to fight me in melee and i protect him by shooting you with a flamer and then callous disregard is supposed to be like harmful to both but the flamer is the safest weapon to shoot into melee which is the silliest thing and i think that's hilarious and i love it yeah it used to be it used to be the trench sweeper because you would almost never take the flamer on a roster it wasn't worth the roster slot but in 2.0 the trench sweeper shotgun hit on twos Mm -hmm. so it was so often for him to be my callous disregard because i'm like all right cool i walk up and i shotgun you hitting on twos four hits good talk plus Um, the sniper now now you use the sniper it used to be sniper would hit on threes now the sniper shoots on twos and stays silent all game that sniper is so good and i i will argue that he is the best gunner of the options. Now he counts as a gunner. Fully agreed. Things, fully, one, fully agreed. One, one blooded have now been, been unlocked to take up to three gunners. The sniper does count as one. If you're not taking the sniper, I need an explanation to my face of why. Because he hits on twos, stays concealed, has mortal wounds one or dev one, however you want to word it. Even shooting through obscurity, he's very commonly... Four hits on the roll, three hits going through, and if you're shooting through obscurity into a five up armor save, four up armor save, getting six to three damage for free from across the board, even through obscurity, that's like putting people on their armor saves. And then you test the novitiate play if you even if it's novitiates, do you really want to spend that faith point on three damage that's going through? And if you don't, I can do six damage. I can kill that four wounded novitiate, no problem. I did kill 10 win models all day long. Four wound of Ishit, even with one half damage, going to go down. Get them out of here. Yep. Love that. Um, and the other thing on the note of the sniper that I wanted to shout out is the sniper plus the enforcer, which was tech that came with my trying to figure out beta decimal with blooded. It seems like a train wreck. Maybe you've got something, but it's like put a heavy barricade on a vantage. Your sniper and your enforcer go up there. The enforcer makes the sniper shoot twice, and uh, it's kind of cute. Yeah, I have not used the enforcer to do that yet. I've staged it in uh, into the dark, um, but the enforcer of just making someone do a one APL action has been very different, very amazing. Uh, I had it in a game recently in the Inquisition on End of the Dark. Uh, my plasma gun had run up and killed his Death World vet, um, and he activated somewhere else. My enforcer moved up into cover, yelled at the plasma gunner to go on guard, and on guard killed the uh, plasma cannon servitor. Uh, so it's been really amazing to be able to force people into different actions that they're not used to used to really being able to do. Um, like give out more drugs for relentless. 
do extra heals. If uh, if your Ogren gets battered up, the healer runs up, heals him. The enforcer runs up and says, "Heal that boy some more." You can't because they can only be affected by this by the drug ones. By the Rest in peace ones. to my emotions, because yeah. that would have been cool. So you, so you can't double heal, but the other part of what like brings the medic up and stonks is once you have double, you, once you have relentless on the three operatives that you normally wanted on, right? Is that now you realize that you're like, oh wait, I didn't bring any troopers for mission actions. Well, my medic's not doing anything else important because he already gave relentless to people, and the feeling of pain is not what it once was. So it's hardly worth taking in a lot of instances. Maybe there's an argument to put it on the thugs since they'll get double damage reduction. But even then, it's like a maybe. So now he's a mission action for whatever your home objective is. And that's usually how I use him because he's run out of uses after that. The The team is something that I'm extremely, like almost intimate with. I've been playing Blooded practically since they came out. Um, uh, they are what I earned my first golden ticket on last year. Uh, they are the team that I've earned a golden ticket on this year. And I don't know if I'll be able to play them next year because as much as they've said you have a year until they get declassified, they haven't really clarified if that's before Worlds or after Worlds or when that when that chopping block hits. And so if I took any other team besides Blooded into Worlds this year, I'd probably feel really bad about it, especially if I could not bring them next year. Um, they've just been what I've been using, what I've been most known for. and. They give like some of the best games I've ever had. Uh, there's a lot of these teams out there that feel re- oppressive. Higher Tech Circle can feel oppressive with the Nanomine. Uh, Legionnaires can feel oppressive with the damage reduction and just the killing power. Death Guard even can feel oppressive with the damage reduction that they put out. Warp Coven definitely feels oppressive. Nothing about Blooded feels oppressive. So it always gives are. me good games. Yeah, well, yeah. We just kill really good, but we don't have any agency on your rules, which is the biggest part about it, right? Um, like, Warp Coven, the saltiest thing about Warp Coven is when you're like, cool, I rolled a crit, and I'm like, yep, that crit's a two, grats. Because fate yeah. itself is my weapon is so good. Being able to manip- manipulate your dice, we have learned over the course of these many years of playing this game, is a very powerful tool. The Vicious bread and butter of last year, Kashkin power, manip- manipulating their dice is what got buffed. We all know manipulating your own dice is strong. Manipulating your opponent's dice is f***ing busted. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Bananas. <laughs> it's real, so good. Insanity. Um, and Blooded don't do any of that. Even when they redirect a fight, you're still fighting someone. You're still shooting someone. You're still probably killing whatever it is you're shooting or fighting. Because even the Ogren has, only has a 5-up armor save. So even, like... Four four shotguns put him down more often than I'd care to admit. It's really about making sure that you send your f- extremely unfair melee pieces into the correct spots at the right time and cut holes through your opponents, which is ultimately generally feels a little bit better because people don't like getting shot at, but at least in melee you get to hit back. Yeah, and not only that, but like if you if you get to jump on me, you get to charge me and kill me. Cool, I'm only going to hit you once before I die and then blow up and possibly do more damage. Bitter Demise is such an amazing tool. So I'm going to go over the strategic point. So flavor. Yeah. So I, I love, that's something else about Blooded is through and through, they're one of the most flavorful teams from how they worked functionally to ploys. It's great. They don't do teamwork. They don't do teamwork. They just want to kill stuff. Which um, is extra flavor. Yeah, extra flavor. Reckless Aspirants has changed from getting a Blooded token to uh, getting accurate one when your opponent's to half. If you have a blooded token, which normally gives you accurate one, now you have punishing. So all of your lethal fives, all of your guaranteed crits from Gaze of the Gods gives you punishing, which is really, really useful. Um, that's almost the most common strategic ploy I've used really commonly. The other part of it is um, glory kill. It used to be balanced against one person. Uh, you pick a target that you can see and you, your whole team gets balanced against that guy. Now it's ceaseless. And then if you have a blooded token, it becomes relentless. So your Melta gun is now relentless against the target. That guy's dead. I don't care what it is. That thing's dead. Like, you got to roll real hot on your saves to save a relentless Melta gun in, in this game, typically. That combined with punishing, you're just like, all right, cool. Good luck. Um, it's really, really powerful. Really nice. Uh, um, the other 
strategic ploys. I don't really use that often. Like my uh, bitter demise gets used really commonly. Bitter demise has a AOS type role. Uh, when one of your operatives dies, you roll a d6. Uh, it says d3. I'm saying d6 so that I can say normal numbers. Um, on a result of a three, so five or six on the dice, you blow up and do that much damage. If you have a blooded token, it's on a three, four, five or six. So you do two or three damage depending on what you die roll, uh, into someone visible and within two of you. And it doesn't have to be the person that killed you. So if they run up and shoot you, and there's someone next to you that you want to do three damage to, you just do three damage to the guy that's the higher priority target, and it gets the damage where you need it. It's great. Plus, you've um, killed that target on the enemy's activation, which makes it extra spicy. Yeah, and like I said, the breakpoints of 14 room models is really tough to go through. You knock that down by three and bring that to 11, and that makes it a lot easier for so many of the blooded tools to, to chomp through. One last thing. Uh, I have very rarely thrown the new Diabolic Bomb. They made in a very big adjustment to it. It's no longer 3-3 three, three, Splash 2. It is 4-3 Dev 2 Blast 2. So it still has Blast 2 on it, but it only does Mortal Wounds to the to them when you roll the attacks against them, not to everybody. It did pick up P1 for that, so it's got AP1 on it. So it's essentially like a very fancy crack grenade. Uh, that very fancy crack grenade gets lethal 5 in a lot of situations. And combine that with the punishing from Reckless Aspirants, and you're talking a lot of damage. Uh, I have refused to throw it, and I'll just throw crack grenades and then charge, because the Diabolic Grenadier has an ability that when he dies, you roll a a d6 or two if he's not in combat and on a four up he explodes if he has not used his diabolic bomb he does d6 plus two damage and this stacks with bitter demise i've done 10 wounds and eight wounds respectively to targets around him uh with combination of bitter demise and him just blowing up from his diabolic bomb it's yeah. so fun yeah because the diabolic bomb requires you to not charge so being able to chuck a crack grenade charge kit, jump in and have someone have to decide to either leave you there or kill you and blow up that's pretty spicy but your opponent can just parry out and wait and then fall back and run away like a coward that's fine with me so burning their apl on that i have tons of apl I have tons of activations to burn i'm that's that's a positive win for me oh no you shoot me later I was dead anyway. It's a Grenadier who's already thrown crack grenade and maybe two. Like he's, he's, his uses are done. He doesn't have any more uses. If he's still alive, I'm questioning how. <laughs> yeah, the power and the flexibility of those who've sacrificed their souls to the chaos gods. Yeah, and that's something else that speaks to like the blooded tools is they have the tools to do damage. It's just knowing and being able to apply those between the heels and getting everything around to make sure that damage sticks is where I've been honing my skills and trying to focus in on as part of my gameplay. All right. Uh, you know, before we split for the, for the night, are there any other Pacific Northwest events you want to give a shout out to before we see you at the world championships? Yeah. No, KTC, uh, kill team, uh, Cascadia is doing an event in December. They're doing their their white elephant one. That's uh, always a good time out in Kaiser, Oregon. Uh, and I know also in March, I want to say March, it might be May. I need to double check on that. We're uh, having a tournament up here, uh, it, up in Bellingham. Uh, a friend of mine, Sean's running that. I might end up TOing for that. Uh, they're trying to get a golden ticket for that for next year, uh, but that's going to be a multi multi day event as well. So those are tournaments that I'm looking forward to on the horizon, as well as LVO, since apparently I'm getting uh, drugged to LVO this year. So anyone that's there, stop by, say hi. There's a pretty high chance I'll be there, too. Sweet. Nice. Well, if there's any last words you have for the blooded hopeful or players struggling against elites before we head out, now's the time, Brandon, before we split. Patience is the key to it. It is so hard to have the amount of patience when you have three to four Marines knocking on your door, especially since hold them back or contain is such a very popular uh, attack op to, to take for anyone with security. Um, looking for that time to strike and understanding where your damage comes from 
no matter what team you have, is really the key to p- making sure that damage sticks. And the more you can make the damage stick, uh, just re- practice and repetition of setting up those plays. They do take setup, they do take patience, and they do take some forethought. But the plays are there. There's there's never been a time where this game has been more volatile than the start of this edition. And I think that we need to take advantage of that and experiment where we can. All righty. Sounds good. Patience is a virtue. Spoken by the chaos faithful. <laughs> well, a weapon if you're using it, right? Patience can definitely be a weapon too. So use it. All right. Well, listeners, good luck with Blooded or any other of the Horde teams out and about trying to deal with the ceremony. We'll catch you very soon, right, Jason? Absolutely. Thank you, listeners, for listening until the end. Be sure to pop in, say hi. Good luck out there.